Welcome to Blackstone Book Talks, a podcast featuring exclusive interviews from Blackstone's bookish network of authors, narrators, and special guests. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Blackstone Book Talks, or Reinventing the Motherhood Memoir, our latest virtual round of digital discussion. We're so excited to have Blackstone authors Adiba Nelson and Taylor Harris here. They're going to be joining us to discuss their memoirs, motherhood, and everything in between. Adiba is recently off the book launch tour for Ain't That a Mother, a memoir of postpartum, palsy, and everything in between that has been named a most anticipated title from Shondaland, Essence, and Bustle. Taylor is the author of our 2022 audio format release, This Boy We Made, a memoir of motherhood, genetics, and facing the unknown that has been named a most anticipated title of the year by Essence, Electric Literature, and The Millions. So I'm so excited to have you guys here. I am such a huge fan of both of your memoirs. I love your approach to storytelling, living your truth, and speaking from the heart. So I thank you guys for joining us. And for everyone that is joining um, virtually, you have the option to be able to submit questions through Facebook or Zoom, and I'll be passing them along to our authors throughout the event. So with that said, um, hi guys. Hi. <laughs> Great to have you here. Um, and um, I'm gonna be kicking it off with the first question. We're coming off of you know Mother's Day or Mother's Month. So happy belated Mother's Day to you both. And I wanted to ask you, with you guys both having a novel that is so focused and centric on the motherhood experience, I'd love to know a little bit about your story, your approach to storytelling, the, you know, your technique, the importance of the novel and how you applied it to your process. First of all, thank you, Bella, for having me. This is so much fun. It's my first time doing this, so I'm excited about it. Um, for me, it was more so I needed the reader to first just become a friend, right? So my storytelling approach is very casual. It's kind of one of those where, let's say you have like a crazy night out and you get to your girlfriend's house and you're like, get a glass of wine, I got a story for you. So I wanted to instantly become friends with my readers. But then I also, in being friends with my readers, I wanted them to kind of be in the room with me, um, see what I saw, feel what I felt, um, just move through those instances, those experiences with me. Um, and that's kind of my approach to anything I'm writing, whether it's a personal essay, an article, a book, whatever it is, it's, um, I need you to be there with me. You have to feel it. Presence, presence is very important to you. Mm -hmm. What about you, Taylor? I can relate a lot to that. This this next hour, I'll probably just be saying ditto a lot. Or <laughs> um, I had the honor of reading a diva's book and I think what we both, uh, I, you can correct me if I'm wrong, you, what I sense that, that you're doing that I also was doing was like taking people in, taking the reader into these like deep, sometimes dark places, but then you'll find these like bits of humor. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and I don't know if I, it wasn't like I set out to, you know, say once a chapter, I want them to laugh or something, but I think it's just sort of a natural rhythm of things. Like I needed, I knew that I needed to bring the reader um, some levity every now and then. Um, that was really important to me. And also I, what resonates a lot with me is wanting someone to sort of pull up next to you, almost like you're sharing a conversation with them. Um, and something I've heard recently that I've been thinking a lot about, the poet Ada Limon says, um, when she writes, it's not just about someone being seen, but even being beheld. And so yeah. I've spent, it's like written on the my little white whiteboard wall, dry erase wall behind me. And it's something that I've just been thinking about because generally I say, I want someone to feel seen. And I think that's really good, but man, what does it mean for someone to be beheld or beholden? I don't even know what the, <laughs> the tense is by your words. Mm, that's, that's never thought of it that way, but that's very, as Danny says, that's deep for sure. Yeah, poets are just like wizards. Yeah. <laughs> wizards. That. That. And you know, it's been said from visibility comes inclusivity. So I'm curious, you know, what does that mean to you in regards to the subject matter of your novels? Do you feel that your it shares the full and encompassing experience? Does it, you know, allow readers to explore one facet of your life or the full spectrum of your life? 
I'll let you take that one, Danny. Um, so I think, you know, in our times, it's a little tricky because I, I look at something like that. And I'm like, well, what do you mean by visibility? What do you mean by <laughs> inclusivity? Obviously, because we come in a time where, you know, businesses, corporation, any, anyone, um, they might say have like, they might hire more people of color, right, to sort of fix the problem, to, to bridge the gap, to fix the disparity. And that sort of representation might not be meaningful. Or we saw the summer of 2020, how all of these anti-racist books were really popular. And it's like, okay, maybe we're really doing something. And then it just sort of seems to be forgotten. Um, and so I'm not completely a skeptic, but I just try to, I guess, be balanced. Um, you know, for me, part of the visibility with this memoir, for one, we always can use more memoirs and, and motherhood stories written by Black women and women of color. That's just, <laughs> that, you know, that's just truth. Also, I think part of me showing up was bringing all of me. And this is something I've said in a lot of my discussions about this book is I'm thankful for a publisher like Catapult and um, an editor like Julie Button who let me bring all of me to the page. And it doesn't mean that everything, every draft stayed the same. I cut a lot of pages, a lot of words, but in a sense of like bringing mental illness, um, racism, you know, motherhood, questions about faith, all of that got to come with me. Um, and I think that's part of it too, not feeling like as a black woman, I have to write one type of memoir. Um, and that felt freeing also. Um, this time I get to say ditto. <laughs> ditto to everything that Taylor just said. Um, but for me, it was also the visibility of black disabled children because we just don't see our kids in the world, and I think that's that's a cultural thing that we have to have our own cultural reckoning with. Um, but also within media representation, we don't see our kids in print ads, we don't see our kids on television, in movies. Um, I can think of yeah, none. No ads, no TV shows or movies that I can think of where I've seen a Black child with a disability. Um, I've seen kids of color, like on Raising Dion, the little girl, um, Esperanza, I think is her name. Um, she's Latina or Latinx, I should say. And she uses a wheelchair. She's got osteogenesis by Imperfecta. Um, and so we see that, but I can't think of a single television show where I've seen a black visibly disabled child or a black child on the spectrum or anything like that. And so for me, because I know that I'm not gonna be here forever, much to my own chagrin, um, I need to make sure that the world knows that our kids are here. And when we're gone, we need you to hold them in the palm of your hands and protect our babies. Um, and you can't do that if you don't know that they're here and you don't see their humanity. And so that was the other part of it for me was, A, motherhood doesn't look the, just one way. As a Black woman, I don't have to write or speak just one way. As a writer, I don't have to write or speak just one way. But also, like, my kid's here, Taylor's kid is here, and we need you to see our kids. We need you to know that they're here. So good. It's so true. And, you know, putting their life out and putting your life out in such a raw way and letting, you know, your readers be able to see these different parts of your life. It really just amplifies the meaning of your story and what people need to be seeing more in literature and just in the world overall. So with that being said, you know, what were some of the early struggles or issues you had with confronting, you know, sharing your life in such an open manner for everybody to be able to see it, as well, including your children as well? You know, I've written a lot of personal essays, so I sort of felt like in some ways I built up to writing a book, um, but a book is a whole different experience, at least it was for me, um, than essays. Um, but I was still somehow surprised, I guess, by like the level of grief and maybe sort of almost like secondary trauma. It was a little bit traumatizing sometimes to sit down and write certain scenes. and. It was really important to me that they unfolded as scenes because um, that's part of you know narrative nonfiction. So I did want 
the reader to feel like they were there and that they were sort of sitting in that unknown with us at the same time sort of writing a scene that features uh, your child having an epileptic seizure is, uh, I don't know, it's something else. I don't regret it at all. I really wanted it in there. And I remember drafting it and I would draft a little bit and watch, like I had videos of him um, through some of those seizures and I would look at them just to sort of help remember. Um, and that was really hard. It's not something <laughs> I'd recommend doing. Um, like I'm glad I have those moments on my phone to show doctors. Um, and also, you know, I don't think as humans we're meant to view those things again and again and again. I would absolutely agree with Taylor. Um, there were some things I didn't realize that I hadn't grieved until I was writing them. And it was shocking to realize, oh, I, yeah, I've never talked about this since this happened, or I've never written about this. Um, but like Taylor, also I had written a lot of personal essays prior to the book, but yes, writing a book is a whole different world. <laughs> uh, takes you down a very different path than writing an essay. Um, but, um, so I wasn't necessarily nervous about having the world see kind of my world because I felt like in some way, in some level, they've already seen a good chunk of it. Like the world knows that I do burlesque. It's no surprise. They've seen the pictures of me in my bra. They've seen pictures of me in my underwear. Like it's no big deal. It's out there, right? Um, but like Taylor talks about having to describe a scene where her son is having an epileptic seizure. And I describe a scene in my book where I have to uh, um, administer rescue med after my daughter is having seizures. And those are very traumatic moments as a parent. <clears throat> and there are definitely times where, you know, I had to kind of step away from it. Um, my daughter, she didn't really seem too interested in the fact that I was writing a book. She was just like, oh, that's great. Like you're doing things. Yay. <laughs> um, um, but she would cheer me on as I would, like she'd come by my office and like give me a high five or whatever. Um, but she got really excited when she saw pictures of herself in the book. And then she thought it was a good book, but only because she was in it, obviously. <laughs> Oh, that's so sweet. Did she see the book printing video? I hope so. She's she did. She did. Okay. Yay, yay. <laughs> uh, I mean, with that in mind, you know, sharing your experiences while also being a mother and living out your life and having that full scale experience, how are you balancing or how did you balance motherhood with finding that space to be able to, you know, share that and write? Um, I'll start by just saying that I've recently thought about, um, you know, this is a small thing to lose throughout the pandemic, right? We've lost 1 million people. Um, and so this is definitely not a comparison to that. Um, but just kind of, I looked back and I was like, oh, I, my routine used to be, I dropped the kids off at school, um, you know, as soon as they were all able to go to <laughs> old enough to go to school for at least half a day. And I hit up the coffee shop. And even if, <laughs> let's be honest, I, a lot of times I like was on the internet, like 70 tabs open, not exactly drafting, but that was still part of my routine. And again, small loss. And it, it's still a loss that over these past two years, I mean, my kids were home for virtual school for a really long time as I, you know, had book drafts due to my editor. Um, and I just, you know, it's been what, a little over two years, I was just realizing um, you know, we've been really careful, masked up. And so I haven't been back to a coffee shop except to like grab takeout and go. <laughs> and so I've just been thinking like that, that really changed things for me. So we've been able to, to adapt. Thankfully, I have um, a spouse who was willing to shift his schedule some to, you know, because at some point you're like, ah, I know my writing's not really paying the bills and I still got to do this. <laughs> Um, and so thankfully, you know, he loves supporting me. So it was like, okay, so how do we shift our family schedule and our work schedule so that on our family Google calendar, it is, you know, Taylor writing time, three to five or whatever, whatever it was. 
Um, and for me, that was really helpful because um, Adiba, I don't know if you were home at all with your daughter for schooling, but I am not a gifted facilitator of education through the virtual format. <laughs> Girl, let me tell you. <laughs> You know how we find our like high points and our low points. I found out real quick what my low point was, <laughs> real quick. I um, initially went to college to be a teacher, and thank God I did not follow through with that because every child mm. would have failed under my tutelage. I am not cut out for this life. <laughs> God bless the teachers um, because the pandaroni tried to kill us. <laughs> um, we got COVID twice, actually. Oh. Um, right when it first started, um, and all the kids were home, brought that home with her. Um, and at first it was like, okay, like, this is kind of fun. It's cool. We're hanging out. And I didn't have my book deal when the pandemic first started. So I was just writing essays, um, working with my agent, shaping up the proposal, getting it in tip top shape. So, and she was in the fifth grade. So like, it's easy peasy, right? Mm. And the teachers were trying to like figure out what this was going to look like. So for two weeks or maybe three weeks, we didn't have school. So we were just watching HGTV trying to like make it through life. Um, Then second school, summer came, I had the book deal in May. Summer came and it was the summer of hell. Like May, 2020, June, 2020 Mm. was like, the summer that wouldn't end Mm -hmm. so I think like most other black people in our country I was just in a deep depression didn't write a thing yeah got the book deal and was like pause (laughs) not not today um and then I moved the following month and then August school started and that's when I was like okay I gotta start working on this book but my kid has a one-on-one for school but she's doing school from home Mm -hmm. and she also is not about this life (laughs) because for her home is home not school right and that was I'm just gonna say it judge me out there in parent land if you want to I sure was drinking a glass of wine while trying to get my daughter through like sixth grade math like look away from the camera take a sip because I was losing my mind um it was not easy it was not easy and eventually I had to bring in help to just have a one-on-one with her so that she could do school in her room Mm -hmm. and I could try to get some chapters done um and then I would take a break at lunch have lunch with her then she'd go back to class on the Zoom computer, I'd go back to writing, and then I would write after she went to bed. Wow. But it was, it was a whole lot of like, let me pause so I can hear her having to fit in the room because she's not trying to do this classwork mm-hmm. at home. Yeah, not easy. Not no. easy at all. And this is a safe space, by the way, Adiva. So you <laughs> have that glass of wine. Nobody call okay. CPS on me. <laughs> Nobody. <laughs> oh my well with that in mind you know even taking the pandemic out of it would you say that there was a noticeable shift in your writing you know before and after having your child and the experience of having them being growing from a toddler to a child do you feel that you're growing along with them in the process I would say yes I would say that my daughter is consistently growing into the growing me into the person I'm supposed to be and not by any responsibility that I'm putting on her, just as she grows, I grow, you know? As her needs change, my, my need to be able to adjust to them change. And that adjustment means sometimes looking within myself, um, doing my own therapy to figure out how I wanna handle whatever is being thrown my way. Yeah, and I would just say uh, as my uh, mine were all in elementary school for the first time. We had one drop off this year, which I don't know that that, I don't think that'll ever happen again. Um, that was miraculous. <laughs> um, and it happened to be the year my book came out. Um, and so what I feel is the shift of like, okay, I went from sort of being um, 
a grad student and then a stay at home mom who sort of wrote about like silly toddler stories um, to kind of keep that part of my mind still still working. Um, and now it's like, I never sort of saw my mom or saw myself as someone who like loved baking and cooking like big dinners and like keeping the house really clean. I just sort of felt like, okay, this is like a privilege that I can stay home with my kids and it's hard, but I, but I think it's what I want to do. And now that they're in school, I'm sort of like, like, what does this look like for me now as this writer, mom, person? Um, I, I feel like a shift is happening. And I don't, I don't want to assume that necessarily means like another book right away, because honestly, I could use a breather after this. <laughs> um, maybe it just means, you know, freelancing more. Um, but I really, I think that's what I'm feeling for the first time in several years. My oldest is 11. And I'm feeling like, oh, we are getting everybody through those toddler preschool years. Mm -hmm. And now maybe it's time for something else for me. And, you know, I think that that's, it says, you know, that your children grow, you grow, your stories grow. And where would be the next avenue that you would like to take? Would you explore something different? Would you want to talk about your life still? Or would you be completely in a different genre? I think I'm creative nonfiction for life. Yeah. <laughs> but do you have anything else up your sleeve? Um, I really want to try my hand at fiction okay. and at suspense thriller, okay. like chiclet, but like murder. <laughs> it's cute when you smile and say <laughs> it's less threatening. <laughs> um, I'd really like, I really, I would love to try my hand at both those, but I know that I definitely have more creative nonfiction up my sleeve. Um, I'm still always going to be the girl that writes creative nonfiction personal essays. Mm -hmm. um, that's just because I believe like as women, as Black women, as Latin women, as mothers, um, there is so much that we need to say that we've been told we cannot say or we should not say. Mm -hmm. And I'm just over that. <laughs> yeah. So I want to tell all the secrets. <laughs> All the taboo. <laughs> yes, yes. So we have actually a user question right now from an attendee named Agatha, and she would like to know, for both of you, um, what what moment did you know that you needed to put your stuff, your child's story, down on paper? Um, I can say briefly that I'd been writing about, like I said, sort of silly, sometimes serious stories about about raising two toddlers. Um, and then, you know, my son had that day where he's almost two and his blood sugar is at 27 and we don't know what's wrong yet. Um, and so that definitely started me down a certain path. But I remember sitting in a cafe, again, a cafe in Charlottesville, um, opening up, I think, an email or a test result. And it had to do with something like my son had been tested and it affected me genetically. Um, and we were working our way up sort of the family tree. Um, and I remember getting like that email or, or doctor's notice and being like, I think this is going to be a book and not like the most exciting or happy moment of like, yay, I think this is going to be it. like it was it was sobering news. And yet I felt like, you know, what, my like my health and my life are so intertwined with this that I think there's something there. Um, for me, I didn't initially intend on writing a motherhood memoir, but my memoir journey started years before I actually started the proposal. Like I'd been tinkering with the idea of writing a memoir, but it was more so about my own life, like pre-motherhood, because I always say, if I were to tell you my whole life story, you would think I made it up and that it was a lifetime movie. Um, <laughs> because it's just it's so bizarre <laughs> so bizarre um so I initially thought that would be my memoir um but then when the opportunity struck for me to you know actually submit a proposal for memoir um I submitted two different tracks like that idea of like my life before motherhood and then my life in motherhood and um we decided to go with my life in motherhood. And I'm actually really glad that that's the route um, I went. Um, it's more meaningful 
it I think it it's the story that needed to be told at the time that needed that it needed to be told. How did you manage to keep the book so clear and not get bogged down with the technicalities of medical diagnosis? That's really kind. When P I've been asked that question a couple of times over the last four months or so, and it always sort of surprises me and not just in a, like, I'm not being corny, just thank you. That means a lot. Um, I went through a lot of medical records. I requested all of my son's medical records. So like, I just remember... I was born in the 80s. That's all you need to know. Like grew up with like Oregon Trail and like the, the big floppy disks. And so I just remember going on a website and like bunch like punching a bunch of keys and then like and not, you know, you feel like on those sites you're just like sending things into a black hole. But then like <laughs> these two like priority mail boxes showed up at my front door and they were all his like printed medical records. And it was the most I know my husband thought like I was losing it, but I just remember being so happy. Like this really worked. Um, and so I went through those, like, I mean, really old school, like hole punch them, three ring binder, highlighter, post-it notes. And like, I just went through everything. And I, I even got records from me from when I was um, like seeing a pediatrician and some of my therapy notes as a teenager. And so all that to say, I don't know exactly how I did it. A lot of revision, a lot of um, insight from my editor, Julie, at Catapult. Um, but I'm just, that means a lot when people say that because there were a lot of, um, there's a lot of medical jargon out there and some of it's necessary, I think. Um, but also I'm glad like anyone can pick it up and, and read it without feeling like they needed to go to med school. I always joke that, um, like my one goal in college was to not take a science class. And I did that <laughs> and graduated. And so I feel, sometimes I feel like, I think in her book, Adiba says like, God has a sense of humor. And that's what I felt like, like, oh, you're gonna skip the science requirement? Or are you gonna yep. get like an education in genetics after? <laughs> yep, yep. How do you manage the medical jargon and telling the story without getting too into the technicalities and just focusing on the moment itself? For me, it was more so I didn't want people to get hung up in that. Mm -hmm. um, that's why a lot of times I just tell people cerebral palsy mm -hmm. because people know what cerebral palsy is. It's a familiar mm -hmm. diagnosis. When I say bilateral schizencephaly, mm -hmm. kind of like a, what? How do you mm -hmm. spell that? And mm -hmm. I, I really, like for me, it was just so important that people just, see the humanity of my kid and mm -hmm. see our humanity as mother daughter as black mother daughter as latina mother daughter so i didn't want people to get lost in medical mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> um and trying to understand what this meant or that meant i just did a very blanket she has this she has this this is what it means moving along yeah, and to that, if I can chime in here for a second, uh, I think that made me think of the scene where I think your daughter is like helping put makeup on you. Um, and just how meaningful that was. Um, you know, I really wanted the same with my son, Tofs. I really, that was a concern of mine. Like, I yes, I've got to crack this medical stuff wide open. And like, is a reader going to leave having a sense of who he is? Yeah. Um, yeah, and that was really important. And I felt like you did that right from the start with putting on the lip gloss and things. Thank you. And I think also just for us as Black moms in this day and age that we live in, with our children having disabilities, it is so important that people understand who our children are. Mm -hmm. um, because we're not, we're, they're going to go out into the world without us, right? Yeah. Um, and anything can happen out there. Um, so I think, especially as black as black parents, like it's important to me that people know, like, this is who my daughter is. Mm -hmm. If you see her, like, this is who she is. Um, when I did my Tucson launch here, I made it very clear. And Tucson's a, a big small town, right? Mm -hmm. Everybody mm -hmm. knows everybody, sadly. <laughs> Um, we all know each other's business, it seems like sometimes, but I made it a point to say, you know, when I'm gone, this kid belongs to you. Mm. Like you're her community when I'm gone. So you need to know her. You need to understand who she is. 
And it's so much more than just a diagnosis. It's a whole personality. Although you do a pretty good job of showcasing her personality, her big personality <laughs> that matches yours. <laughs> well, you know, my friends say God gave you the kid you deserved. Well, I <laughs> I, she's great. And, you know, with that in mind, what is your favorite thing about being a mom? You know, what is oh, wow. at this present time of their life? Um, I really, I'll tell you what I miss and tell you what I enjoy now. I, I'm starting to really miss like the cuddling. And again, speaking to sort of a shift I'm feeling for myself in motherhood of like, you know, like they're getting like long and lean and like bony, which is like, <laughs> I think it's fun to see them grow up, but you're like, I'm like really missing the baby stuff. Um, but then like just having the, like the privilege and the gift of like writing something that, that at least for me at age 39 feels true about them and about motherhood. And, you know, they might contest it or change it as they um, read the story when they're older. And I think that's okay. There's space for that too. Um, but I get to hand this to them and be like this, you know, mommy really loves you. And, and this is the way I tried to, this is one way that I tried to show that. Mm -hmm. um, I'd say for me, the thing that I'm loving right now is just watching her little personality, like <laughs> just become even more of who she is and her sense of humor. Like she thinks she's so funny and she is so funny. <laughs> she's a riot, but like the way her sense of humor comes out, like she cracks me up. Um, and I'm really loving seeing like how she, how she works that into her daily life. Mm. And some of the stuff that she comes up with, I have no idea. Like, where did you even see that? How did you know that was funny? But how does anyone know that what they do is funny? <laughs> like she just kind of has that. Um, and so I'm really loving that. What do I miss? It sounds a little cheesy, but like sometimes, you know how like Facebook will give you Facebook memories mm -hmm. and sometimes they're videos. Mm -hmm. I miss her little voice, awesome. like her, her little kid voice. Like her, she has this deep voice now. It's kind of raspy, um, but it's deep and it has these different intonations, but it's not that little squeaky voice that she had when she was little. Um, and I listen to those. And I'm just like, oh, <laughs> she was so little. So yeah, like that, that is what I mean. I still get the cuddles. So I'm going to take them for as long as I can get them. Yeah. Um, she just turned 13 and I'm still getting hugs. Oh. So I'll take it. <laughs> um, but yeah, I would say that. I mean, those are, that's really special. And, you know, with your novels, the biggest thing that I see there, and there's a your collective theme of facing your fears, living your truth and facing the moment and facing it your way. Um, so with that, I would love to ask both of your takes on how do you handle facing the unknown, especially when it comes to parenting and you know living authentically. I, for me, I think in the world of disability, there's always an unknown. Mm. Every doctor's appointment, there's the possibility of there being an unknown. Um, so you just have to like, it, it almost feel like a constant girding of your loins, if you will, <laughs> just like putting on the armor, like, okay, this could be good. It could be bad. I don't know. Um, but we're going to take it for what it is. We're just going to roll with it. Um, and the authenticity part is just, you know, feeling what you feel in the moment, because I want my daughter to understand that it's okay to feel what you feel in the moment, but we don't stay there. Like if, if we're sad, it's okay to be sad. Um, if we're scared, it's okay to be scared, but we can't stay there, you know? Mm -hmm. um, but we, we do have to acknowledge it. But I think there's always an unknown. Like I always say, it's always something. It's always something. Yeah, I agree. Um... And even just, you mentioned sort of being in the moment, being present, you know, that again, sort of finding that line between just being here. And then even as we look, we're, we're sort of coming up on middle school uh, for my son and thinking about what that might look like for him, uh, like the best environment for him. So like, while you're, 
you, you sort of have to project, <laughs> but also don't want to do that too much because you're like, we have today, this is what, you know, this is what we have. Um, and then I would say also for me, my, uh, my faith is foundational. Um, and like my faith has shifted or, or changed or made room, um, or, or maybe it's been molded somewhat by, by this because I just have a hard time now, um, sort of saying like, you know, there's a song we've been listening to recently. It's, it's like a nice tune, but it has a lot of sort of binaries, like from broken to healed, from, you know, X to, you know, A to Z. And I, I feel like, you know, my story with Tobes is that like, you can have faith and I very much, you know, believe in God's love for us. And like, <laughs> I'm much more interested in what it looks like for God to be with us. Um, rather than like, oh, I have this problem and like God fixed it or like I was sick and now I'm healed or, you know, broken and now set free. And like, there's nothing wrong with, there's nothing wrong with those. It's just that sort of template has not fit my experience. <laughs> it's been very much like we are in the middle. We are still in the middle. Here we are <laughs> between. <laughs> Yes. And so if I don't have like a guy who speaks to that, then I'm like, uh, what am I, you know, what is this about? Yeah. Yeah, for sure. We have another question now from Corey and it's for you, Adiba. The question okay. is earlier, I heard Adiba mention burlesque. Are you a dancer as well as an author? How do you manage to do it all? I was a burlesque performer. I retired um, in October of 2021. Um, I miss it terribly. Um, <laughs> I was both an author and a performer. I performed for six years. Um, <clears throat> and the reason I retired was because there is a lot that goes into burlesque, you know, making your costumes, choreographing your routines, then learning your choreography that you put together, yeah. um, doing rehearsals, doing shows. Um, it's also an expensive thing because um, fabric is oddly oddly expensive <laughs> um and so I don't do that anymore but that's not to say that bang won't you know make an appearance here and there once every couple of years or so with this you know the theme of this event is reinventing the motherhood memoir and I would love your take on just what you think that entails and how we can, how mothers can be reinventing the way that they tell their stories, how mothers can be better showcase all different facets of life, different spectrums of life, and how these types of stories can help to do that. Um, okay. I'll just say, you know, not just my book, but when I think about sort of the essays and the stories online that pull me in, I won't say this is like a silver lining or like a good thing that came out of the pandemic, because I want to be careful about that language, but something that I've seen is like us just being very real about being pushed to our limits. Um, you know, and black mothers, I think all the more, um, you know, just even after this weekend, right? It's like we're facing these traumas over and over again. They're collective, the grief is collective. Um, and so it doesn't quite answer your question about like how to reinvent, but I just think, um, what we're doing when we're, I, I don't want us to all be this tired all the time. I don't think we're built for this. I don't think it's healthy. It's certainly unjust um, in many cases. And um, I'm thankful that, you know, when I first had my daughter, I think of those mommy blogs as being sort of like the how-to guide, like how to do things like you know, glass bottles and like <laughs> the right wooden toys <laughs> and things like that. Um, and certainly there were others out there too, but, but that was sort of my thinking, like this is what I need to do. Um, and I'm so much less interested in that now. Um, and I feel like when I go on Twitter, which yes, I get it can be like a garbage fire, but sometimes what it does is I feel like I actually have some community because I will see other mothers out there writing and saying like, I am screaming for help. Is anyone listening? And so while I don't want any of us in that position, especially not over two years, um, that is something that resonates with me. Just sort of dropping the facade. This is where we are. I honestly couldn't have said it any better. Like just 
rewriting the motherhood memoir is like a, dropping the judgment that there's no room for judgment in parenthood motherhood parenthood none of it um and just mothers giving other mothers the freedom to just tell the truth whatever their truth is and understanding that just because it's not what your mothering journey looks like or your parenting journey looks like doesn't mean it's wrong doesn't mean it's any less parenting or any less mothering it's just someone else's journey that's beautifully said and you know with that in mind what can the reading writing community and just the world overall do to better foster disability inclusion advocacy better understanding overall you know just from the mother's perspective what do, what do you guys think what did you say i said i want another book deal so i don't know if i should say <laughs> yeah say that it nicely <laughs> I, would, I would just like to see less gatekeeping uh. Um, I feel like a lot of times, and I'm, I'm so grateful for Black Sun that that wasn't the case, but a lot of times um, there was, we don't know how to market her, mm. um, which I felt like was code for what do we do with this Black girl? Um, or like they love, some people love the voice, but it's, it's too casual. Mm -hmm. um, but that's how, like, when girls get together, we're not out here doing prose and poetry telling you about our date last night. Mm -hmm. Like, we're keeping it very real. Like, girl, do you know what this dude said to me? Like, that's how we speak to each other. When moms are talking about what's going on with their kids, we're not speaking in Elizabethan English. Mm -hmm. We're talking about this kid's about to get snatched for his entire life because he's <laughs> a straight fool. That's, that's what we do. It's real. It's real. And so I would like to see um, less gatekeeping and more um, openness to all the different kinds of ways that stories can be told um, from all different cultural perspectives. Yeah, and um, that's great. And I will just add, you know, a couple of things that come to mind. One, I think, Adiba, you did um, an event recently with Disha Filial, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so this obviously isn't something that needs to change, but I, I'm just, something that came to my attention writing that I might not have picked up on is that this Black woman whose book just kind of took off, skyrocketed. Um, I just find that she takes so much time and there are a few Black writers like her that I feel like, you know, their books did super well. They obviously have writing lives and speaking engagements and they're teaching and they're, they're doing all these things. And I find that she took the time to pick up my little book and read it, right? And put her stamp of approval or encouragement on it. Um, and I find that that's really, that's just something that I won't forget and that I'll try to do um, as I move along too in my writing career. Um, and the other, <laughs> the other thing, again, I would also like to get another book deal with like <laughs> a billion dollar advance one day. So that part lightly, but, <laughs> but, you know, I, I, one thing that gets to me too, um, and I, and I know another writer um, just mentioned this recently in one of their publications, you know, how you get these requests, like, <laughs> like we need quick, we need like, we need a take on this racist event or quick, we need, um, we need a list of like 10 black authors or 10 black books we should read. And like, those are great. And um, just this sort of sense that we can sort of be called upon at any time to like deliver content like that, that kind of rubs me um, the wrong way. I still sort of feel like, I'm sure publishing has made strides and I still sort of feel like there's this white norm for the, for the motherhood memoir to all kinds of books. And then we're sort of like these niche like writers, you know, where I don't think that needs to be. No, and it's also people can do the work themselves, you know, to better <laughs> understand things. So at the end- Ella of the can month, say that. <laughs> <laughs> no book here. <laughs> can, I, um, can I add a little thing? Yeah, of course, of course. I would like to, and again, Blackstone did me so good on this, but I would like to see um, 
publishing houses diversify their editor pool. Um, I've heard from other Black women writers who have had to go back and forth for hours and days with editors who are redlining AAVE. And if you don't know what AAV is and you're watching this, it's African-American vernacular English um, or what they used to call back in the day Ebonics or just how folks talk nowadays um, and correcting all of the things. Um, that how we speak to each other is authentic to how we speak to each other. Mm -hmm. And to have someone come in and say that is wrong, like that act in and of itself is wrong on so many levels. But when you have, like, I was so blessed to say, these are the Black editors I'd like to work with. This is my mm -hmm. first pick. And Black Sun was like, here you go. We got her. <laughs> um, so I was really blessed to have that. Um, but that just lends to the authenticity of the story being told when you can have editors in the room who know authentically this culture, whether it's disabled culture, LGBTQ culture, Black culture, Latin culture, all of it, you just really need to diversify um, your editor pool, your general, not your Blackstone. <laughs> um, that's a very good point. And you're raising a lot of you know topics that are still present in the writing community, the publishing community, and it's something that needs to be discussed. And you know what better way to do it than with people who actually write about speaking their truth and live it, living authentically. So I completely, I agree with you, and I see that there. And I think with time, you know, publishing is shifting, and I see a lot of new opportunities for more stories to be told, and I'm looking forward to them overall. <laughs> um, you know, one of my final questions for you guys would be, overall, just for somebody who's new to the world of parenting or even new to the world of narrative, nonfiction, memoir writing, what would be you know, that personal piece of advice that you would give to them, that you know, personal touch of being a parent? What would be your tidbit? I would say maybe, um, at least for me, one thing I looked at was like, how many times am I saying should to myself? <laughs> so going back to those comments about like, the wooden toys, and <laughs> organic this and that, like I'm not against organic things, but, but like how many times when you are just trying to like feed a baby, which now is like a problem for a lot of parents, um, right, you know, right in this moment, um, you know, you're just trying to hold it together, right, and you might have good days where, where you're doing more than just holding it together, but, um, one thing that I'm pretty sure someone had me do and that was helpful was just like point out, just sort of kindly, gently point out, like, did you just say should? Um, and that was helpful for me. And so I would just say, try to chill out even though you're not sleeping. Um, and maybe, <laughs> maybe back up on the shoulds. <laughs> um, I think the one thing that I would always tell myself was if you all went to bed and everybody was still breathing and you woke up the next morning and everyone's still breathing, that's a win. The day can go up in flames, but everyone goes to bed happy and healthy, that's a win. The day's a win. Um, days are not going to be perfect. Um, we should never, especially when you're a parent, oh my God, don't ever expect the day to be perfect. <laughs> <laughs> um, if it is like you get on your knees and you thank God, <laughs> um, but you know, we can't, you can't beat yourself self up over all the little things kind of ties right into Taylor's like should, like there's no room for should, um, in parenting. It just, it is what it is. You take it one day at a time and, um, ice cream for dinner is still dinner. I really like that one. Yes, well, yes, you would. <laughs> Writing ice cream after all. <laughs> I love both of those answers. So you know, how do you find the strength within yourself when those times are tough? Or how did you, it, you know, during those first initial what the heck moments? Um, for me, it's my faith. Like I'm not a deeply religious person, but I am a very spiritual person. Um, I pray to God as, you know, my homie, a big homie up there. And we have a very interesting relationship, but he knows me. I know him. We're tight. 
And I've always relied on my faith to pull me through. Um, I've always said, you know, one way or another, I'm going to land on my feet um, because, you know, God's a promise keeper. And he says, you know, I will not leave you or forsake you. Like I was raised in the church. So I know these things inherently and I do hold them, you know, true to me. Um, says, it's not going to leave me or forsake me. So then I'm going to be okay. I believe it. That's, and it might sound weird to somebody, but that's what gets me through. Yeah, I would concur, agree. And, um, and then I would just add for me community, um, I'm thinking very practically, like the people who dropped off food on my porch, <laughs> um, both after I had kids and then later, you know, with medical treatments and surgery, the, that was huge, you know, to get to, no city, no home is perfect, but man, to be in a place where you've experienced solid community, I think is a, is a huge blessing. Yes, 100%. One of our panelists, um, Danny, she had commented during the event that she loves how your faith shifted due to your experience and it speaks to another taboo cultural narrative, which I think is a really interesting point, especially for you know your book, Taylor, how you mentioned your faith had changed during this experience. And it's just, you know, you can really, really shift how you see things and how your outlook is. Um, so I think my final question for you guys, because this has been a lot of fun and the hour is almost there, would be, if there would be one takeaway message for a reader who's not acquainted with your memoir and a way that you could best describe it in one sentence. I would like mine to be described sort of as like um, a love letter to my son, like, but a love letter that takes you into the unknown. Um, again, where you're not always safe, but, but you're always loved. Oh, that is so sweet. <laughs> Now I feel like a jerk. <laughs> Gosh, way to go, Taylor. <laughs> Whoa, no. So not sweet and loving like that. No, say what it is. It's okay. So I always just tell people, like, it is, uh, see, you got people crying up in here. <laughs> it's for allergies. Go ahead. <laughs> Um, I always just tell people it is a hilarious romp through this comedy of errors I call motherhood. Yeah. That, that's it. That's, I mean, because it's funny, but it's poignant. And some of it is so absurd that all you can do is laugh. Like, the, like when I read Taylor that April 1st, mm. I was like, wait, what? How are both wait. like, like it, what is this? Yeah. And again, I had to laugh. I was like, this is absurd. This doesn't <laughs> even make sense. Um, I wish I could show you. I have the book on the floor next to me here. Like almost every page is dog-eared because the absurdity of it, like the, the similarities. Yeah. Are so absurd. So yeah, for me, it's this hilarious romp through this comedy of errors. And even quickly circling back to that publishing question, like I'm thankful that there's room for both of our books, right? I mean, I think I think that's what we're working towards too, where it's not like one of you gets to write the black mommy <laughs> memoir, right? Like only even one. With, <laughs> yeah, even with the similarities and the crossovers, like there's space and there there always needs to be space for us and for, you know, hopefully, you know, 20 times as many black women writers in the next couple of years, you know. Yes. Yes. And, you know, with that said, that's the message for the readers. What would be the message for your children when they read this book? I'm going to let you go first again. I'm picking no. up. <laughs> <laughs> Yours is so beautiful. I just want to say ditto. <laughs> I feel like I used my answer already for the other one. But, but yeah, I've always wanted this to read um, as a love letter to them. And I always, I followed that with, I understand that, you know, Adiba, you can attest to this. When you're writing about your child and you're writing about motherhood, you're you're automatically writing about someone else. Um, I asked my son for his permission and he was six. So it's not like I'm taking that and running with it. I know that we might need to discuss um, at some point what it meant for mommy to share these details of your life. Um, and I just want to be open if and when that time comes to say, here are my intentions. Um, 
I wanted to do you proud. I want to show how much I love you. And I understand if there are some complicated feelings about that. Yeah, much of the same, ditto. <laughs> um, <laughs> but I also, like, there are some complicated stories um, in regards to the other parent, her dad, mm. in the book. Um, and I hope that, like, when she's of age and she reads the um, adapted version of this book, if she ever decides to read the adapted version of this book, um, she will read through all of that and understand that every decision that I made was made out of love yeah. and was made with her in mind and that she understands that, ooh, I'm not gonna do it, I'm not gonna cry. Mm -hmm. That she is, and always has been my why. Mm. Um, I hope that that comes across. It certainly does. I certainly feel it when I read it. There is so much love in that book, both of your books, that it really does ring true. And I, I look forward to the day that they read it because I know that they're going to really see how much their moms love them. <laughs> so, you know, and the, I don't see, oh, we have one more question that I'm actually going to submit from Danny Jer Jernigan. And her final question is, what are some tips for navigating the proposal writing process and finding an agent? I had a very unorthodox way of finding an agent. So I'm gonna let you take that, Taylor. No, wait, I did too. Tell me. <laughs> <laughs> um, I found my agent through a friend of a friend of a friend <laughs> who um, we had submitted my children's book and nobody wanted the children's book, but they all wanted me to write a memoir after watching the documentary and so the woman who submitted the children's book said well I don't handle uh nonfiction. my my colleague does I'm going to pass you over to her I was like oh okay and that's literally it was a friend of a friend of a friend who got me to a children's book agent who then passed me over to my actual agent that's pretty cool um <laughs> Cause you know, some people will be like, oh, I got somebody you should talk to. And it's like, actually nobody that could help. <laughs> <laughs> right. I know so-and-so who knows so-and-so who's Junie's cousin. Oh, thanks. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> um, let's see. So I'll be honest. I took um, a proposal writing class one summer online. Um, like, you know, again, where do you fit your writing in? It was late. It was like eight or eight 30 at night, I think. And I'd go sit in a coffee shop um, while my, you know, the kids were in bed and it helped me just start to piece together my proposal. And then a friend of a friend, like introduced me to their editor um, who gave me great feedback. And um, basically, you know, I got an offer, I got a book deal and then I went and found an agent. Uh, so it felt oh, wow. a little bit backwards. <laughs> um, but that's sort of been the story for me that, you know, I, you know, God is good. I feel like in the areas where it's really hard for me because of the anxiety, some doors have opened. Um, you know, I've, I've, I've experienced rejection, but, you know, the story generally is like, oh, I got 100 rejections before I got one yes. I think God knows if I got more than 50, <laughs> I might shut it down. <laughs> and so it's been hard, but in different ways for me. So I'm thankful for these open doors where I feel like I can walk in and then still work really hard. But I feel like sometimes that, that there's a way made for me. I 100% agree with that. Cause yeah, <laughs> I just, I agree. <laughs> You know, just like a publishing or getting an agent like motherhood, no story is perfect. No story is the same. So yeah. <laughs> it's a journey for sure. Um, and we've been getting a lot of great feedback throughout this event. Just many, many compliments on your outlooks with mothers, how you navigate and personal ways of sharing your love of your children. Um, so I just want to say for everyone who's attending now, thank you for tuning in to Blackstone Book Talks, Reinventing the Motherhood Memoir. We were joined by Adiba Nelson, author of Ain't That a Mother, and Taylor Harris, author of This Boy We Made. It's been great talking to you guys, getting to know more about your, your memoirs, your experiences as moms and as authors, and 
it's been so cool to get to know just a little bit more about you and you know your children, which is such a special part of your memoir works. So for those tuning in, you can learn all about the authors and where to get their releases at blackstonepublishing.com and also blackstonelibrary.com for the audio format edition. And you can find out more about where to access the, the author's website through that. Thank you again, Adiva and Taylor, yeah. and I hope you guys have a great night. Thank bye. You. Bye. 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 Thanks for listening to Blackstone Book Talks with Blackstone Publishing. If you enjoyed this episode and you'd like to help support the podcast, please share it with others, post about it on social media, or leave a rating and review. To catch all the latest bookish news from Blackstone, you can follow us on Instagram at Blackstone Publishing, on Twitter and Facebook at Blackstone Audio, or on our website at blackstonepublishing.com. Thanks again, and we'll see you next time.